evening, everyone. Thanks for joining us. Just waiting for uh, Nick to join in here should be with us momentarily. I'll give folks a couple minutes as well just to tune in. We have a, a good long list of folks wanting to see this one. I think it's gonna be a good time. And there's Nick now. Hey guys, one sec. Let me just get my video rolling here. Yeah, for sure. There we go. We made there it. There it is. <laughs> yeah, yeah. A little bit of fun uh, in the technical difficulties, but that's okay. It wouldn't be uh, one of these things without it, would it, Chris? Never. No, no. So we've got to wait a few more minutes for 801 right now? Yeah, we won't wait too long, but uh, give folks just a, a couple minutes. This will all be posted on YouTube uh, afterwards as well for anyone to, to rewatch too. So if somebody tunes in a minute or too late, they shouldn't much. Awesome. Awesome. Did you get a lot of snow today? Um, came later than I thought it would, but uh, yeah, we've got uh, up where I am a few inches uh, so far and still falling out there. So I can tell you that it must have been when I woke up this morning, it started snowing and it hasn't really stopped since. So, oh, wow. Yeah. And that's only like an hour difference from you. So, it's not that yeah. Far. yeah, it was mostly just kind of rain down the city today. It's always the way. Mm hmm. That tropical Toronto. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. I was good. Of course, like tonight's the night that the kids don't want to go to bed without. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's a little chaotic getting set up, but that's okay. But yeah. I, that's know, I, talk about I was like, just like trying to think about like what we're going to talk about tonight. And I'm like, holy smokes, like this might take a really long time. So you need to keep me on track for time. If I'm like eating up way too much time, then you got to let me know. Okay. Yeah. Uh, you know, that's a way easier the job than, uh, than trying to prompt you and elongate things. So that's cool. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's usually not my problem. My problem is usually talking too much. So <laughs> fair enough. Yeah. So how many, how many, and oh my goodness, there's quite a few people at attendance here tonight. That's good. Yeah, there's a lot more coming, I think. We had uh, yeah, a lot of interest for this one. This is, I think, going to be one of the more popular ones of these. So. Really? Well, it helps awesome, folks thank, thank you for having me. I'm like really flattered that, uh, that you reached out. And uh, I'm more than happy to talk about smallmouth, even if it is, uh, I guess, February now. It feels like a long way away, but it's, uh, it'll be here before we know it. Oh, yeah. Is it four months until opener? more or less yeah yeah well i mean i think most of us just wait for trout opener and then once that kicks off it's kind of like one season just rolls right into the next yeah. one yeah it's really uh i don't know man it's like the best part of living in this province is there's always something to fish for yep agreed it's just sometimes you have to cut a hole in an, in the ice <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, I've, I've, I've never really been a huge fan of that but uh every year i say i'm gonna get more into it though I haven't been this year. Have you been ice fishing at all? No, I shouldn't say that considering we did that whole ice fishing stream. I just haven't had the time, but yeah. still time left. I know. Uh, Matt and I are talking a little bit about getting out, but it's just, it's tough. It's busy. And I don't know myself personally, I'd rather use my, uh, my hall passes from the family for, uh, for some of the other fisheries we have here. So fair enough. Good time yeah. to stock boxes too, right? Yeah. Man, my boxes are getting super full. I know I, I bought like a, a new boat box and uh, looking at looking at it is overwhelming to try to fill it, but it'll be filled by by the time uh, the warmer weather comes, that's for sure. Yeah, sweet. Um, well, should we just get going? Yeah, let's get started here. So um, thank you everybody for joining us. Tonight we are very pleased to be joined once again by Nick Roman. Uh, Nick uh, is 
super fishy guy it seems when it comes to any species but uh definitely a, a really good bass angler and uh he did a, a talk with us a couple months ago now about some fall patterns for smallmouth um and today we're going to talk more about summer bite and in particular crayfish um so yeah nick what, what's on deck what are we doing today uh, i got three crayfish flies to show you um they're all kind of different in their own way i'm somebody that uh i mean i tell everybody especially newer anglers that like you don't need a thousand new fly patterns um you can probably get by with just a handful of flies um and i i try that but it never seems to uh to, to fall into my own practice so I, I just love crayfish flies i love certain types of uh certain types of flies and different forages for fish and i get really into the, the specific forage so um that that's kind of why i wanted to do one just on the on the you know, the, the, the animal of the crayfish, um, because I think that they're interesting and they're, they're definitely an important food source for a lot of different fish. But I mean, I don't really think that you can talk about crayfish, fish and crayfish flies and not talk about smallmouth bass because uh, that just kind of goes hand in hand. So uh, I've had success with tons of different flies, but I'd say these are my three favorite. Um, I probably have four favorites. Um, but I think everybody knows the woolly bugger. So I wasn't going to bore everybody and tie the woolly bugger. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody needs one of these live streams tied a woolly bugger. That's for sure. Um, no, but that is a, that is a darn good smallmouth bass fly. And, uh, I think a lot of anglers out there would say that's probably all you need. And I would tend to agree that if you, all your goal is, is to catch some smallmouth bass, then, um, you really can't go wrong fishing a woolly bugger, but um, as I'm going to talk about just a little bit, a little bit later, there's, uh, there's some other like water conditions, some other times when I might want to fish those other flies. But, um, um, I think I'd rather just start, just give like a little bit of an intro about, um, like how I got into smallmouth bass fishing. Yeah, uh, absolutely. So it was, uh, it was a tough sell for me. I, I started fly fishing really young. Um, and for me, fly fishing meant fishing for trout. And that's really all that I wanted to do. Um, I had, uh, I had some mentors, um, through um, uh, some fly shops here in, uh, in Fergus. And uh, I wasn't really listening to other people telling me how much fun fishing for other species with a fly was. All I really cared about was, you know, the, the brown trout in the Grand River um, and brook trout, and then later on steelhead, which are obviously rainbow trout. Um, and that's all I really wanted to do. And I, I was, I didn't have my mind open to fishing smallmouth. And it wasn't until like, oh, maybe like 10 years ago now, uh, that I started to give it like an honest shot, not just like going fishing for smallmouth when, when there was nothing else, um, but actually trying to figure it out a little bit. And I, and I had my eyes open about just how dialed in you could get with, um, with some of the smallmouth fisheries that we have in our area. And uh, I don't know, lately, like you were mentioning that it's like fly tying season. I, I found that I'm more excited to tie bass flies this winter than trout flies. And I don't, I don't know exactly why that is, um, but it, man, there's some amazing anglers out there. Um, really, really, you know, kind of pushing things when it comes to smallmouth bass. If you're, if you're paying attention to some of the stuff happening in Michigan, uh, with some of the anglers tying huge articulated flies for, uh, for, for smallmouth, um, you got stuff like, like the game changers coming out there, obviously really taking things from the conventional fishing world and bringing them into fly tying. Um, and, and it seems like things are getting pushed further and further and further and really developing around some of our warm water fisheries. And I think where we live here in Ontario, we are in the perfect spot for, for warm water fishing. We have cold water fishing. We got some darn good trout streams, um, but our trout season is limited. Our summers are really, really hot. Uh, there's a lot of other opportunities out there. And I don't know how anyone else is feeling, but I, I want to put myself in a position where I can take full advantage of those. And, and these last couple of seasons, I, I definitely have. So that's really where a lot of this is coming from. I, um, and yeah, I mean, as soon as season opens for bass, I think it's a great time to start fishing crayfish. Um, for those of you that don't know, um, our rivers, well, a lot of our rivers, maybe not all of them, um, but especially a lot of our smallmouth rivers, there's a pretty healthy population of crayfish. Um, I live in Alora, Ontario, and uh, so I'm living right on the bank of the Grand River, and the Grand is full of crayfish. Uh, if you go down into the middle sections and, and you're walking around like uh, the Brantford area and Paris and, and what I would consider to be the, the smallmouth area, um, you look down and you're going to see those little crayfish scooting around everywhere. Um, and that's what those bass are eating. Uh, they're filling their, their bellies full of those things. And so uh, crayfish is a food source. Um, 
I find that a lot of crayfish flies out there and a lot of crayfish patterns, um, they're really big and they often look like flies that, that we might think a crayfish looks like. Um, and so what these flies often look like is they have a really predominant set of claws like a lobster. Um, typically, well, at least what I'm seeing more and more, a lot of anglers tying are flies three and a half to five inches long, even multiple articulations sometimes in some of the patterns. And, uh, and I have no doubt that those, those are effective flies, but um, I, I take a lot of the things that I, that I really love about trout fishing and I try to apply them to my, to my bass fishing. Um, and so I, I'm often taking those same match the hatch principles. So most of the crayfish that I see are actually a lot smaller than um, than the patterns that I'm seeing other anglers, um, you know, posting on social media and those kinds of things. So um, my flies are definitely reflective of trying to match the crayfish that I find in the rivers. And uh, they really do outfish the larger flies that I've thrown at them. Um, I don't know if those are just our fish. Uh, I've talked to some, some local guides and some, uh, some local anglers who, uh, who've been doing this a long time. And um, it seems like everyone's fly box is fishing a lot smaller flies. And so um, you really can't go wrong in that, I'd say size four down to even a size 10 crayfish is just like right in the sweet spot. Um, and so that's the size of flies that I'm gonna be tying. You might, you might've thought that by attending tonight, we we're tying triple articulated stuff. And, um, but that's not what's in my bass fly box. And that's not what I've found success with. Um, I actually was looking online at just some of the biology um, of crayfish. As I mentioned, I, I kind of like to geek out on these things. Not that you need to do any of that sort of stuff, um, but when it's a long winter and you want to just uh, get into the, it's not entomology, whatever the study of crayfish would be, um, of the food source that you're trying to match. Um, it can make for, a, I don't know, a relaxing winter's evening. Uh, but if it's okay with you, Chris, I'd love to just show this, like um, uh, it was in a, um, a, a science journal or a science magazine. And it just shows all the different species of crayfish that we have in Ontario. Do you mind if I share my screen? Yeah, I'd be very curious to see it. Oh, sorry, you can just uh, share a screen. Hang on, I'll have yeah. to. Oh, you're not letting me do it. You, uh, hang you, on, I can, I can do it. I just have to make you a co-host here. Okay. Uh, where is that? I should have given you the heads up. Right now. Share some external. <laughs> all right, go for it. Yeah, it should be clear now. I thought it was really interesting and that it would be helpful. Eh, I don't know if it's going to work, Chris. Yeah, it's giving me like a caution or something. Really? Yeah, that's okay. Hmm. Yeah, you should have, as far as Zoom's concerned, you should be able to do it at this point. But... You know what it is? It's because my um, camera's on. No, it's not going to work. That's okay. Yeah. We'll put it in the footnotes afterwards. But what, what I was just going to show you is a bunch of different species of crayfish in Ontario. Um, and if anybody wants to see that, that um, chart, I'll send it to you. Um, just shoot me a message. But um, it's really interesting because it actually says the max size for crayfish um, in Ontario. So we have lots of different species. Um, I, th I think there's like nine or 10 different, different species. And some of them are actually invasive. Um, the, the rusty crayfish is the one that... Uh, there's a lot of invasive rusty crayfish in the Grand, and they're a, they're a very big crayfish. Um, by the, um, obviously the sounds in their name, they're uh, rusty colors, so they have some rusty markings on their care space. Um, and they're very aggressive and they boot out the other crayfish and the more native species. Um, and uh, there's a couple other invasives, but we have a lot of native uh, crayfish as well, but even, even the really, really um, uh, kind of bullyish uh, uh, rusty crayfish, most often they're, they're only going to be about up to two and a half inches. Most of our native species of crayfish are even smaller. They're less than two inches long. Um, and so again, that's why I'm applying these principles to tying these flies. Um, we have a lot of smaller crayfish and, um, we also have some very clear rivers that we're fishing. And I, I would also suggest that you fish a smaller fly in clearer water conditions, but, um, that's my little crayfish spiel. Chris, did you have any like questions about, about crayfish at all? I'm sure some will come up. But okay. uh, yeah, I definitely agree with that. That premise of, of smaller is probably better. It's, it's my experience too. And like, if you ever, um, 
you know, uh, being a kid, like he used to really enjoy just watching crayfish in small rivers, um, mm -hmm. just kind of sit on a bank and watch things crawl around and you know, count them, whatever. And, um, you always find that, yeah, you'll, you'll catch or, or, or count rather like 10 to one, the, the little tiny guys versus the, the really big, the miniature lobsters in there. So, um, yeah, if you think of just what, what's going to look most appetizing to a fish, uh, yeah. probably prefer not to put this big prickly thing in their mouth with giant claws. So. I'm yeah, with that. yeah. There's some fantastic videos online on YouTube as well that you can watch where um, uh, they actually like footage of bass eating crayfish, and more often than not, you will see these amazing footage of these these crayfish with their claws out, and the bass they, they're hesitant to go for them. They don't want to eat those ones. Uh, when they want to eat them is when they're um, uh, when they're swimming. And if you have never seen a crayfish swim, they swim backwards. They tuck all their little tiny legs underneath their, uh, their tail and they use their tail to propel themselves kind of like this backwards and, uh, and their claws kind of, uh, align. So their claws are no longer out in a defensive posture. And I think that this is what the fish are keying in on is that large meaty morsel swimming relatively erratically through the water, um, in kind of pulsing movements. And that's really what what those fish are going to be looking for. Um, and I've had a lot of success fishing them um, in that style. So giving them pulse movements with the rod. Um, but why don't we get started and we'll tie a fly yeah, up. Let's do it. I mean, you guys didn't, didn't want to come here to uh, just to me talk, did you? <laughs> what does I like to do it? <laughs> All right, I'm just going to move my camera a little closer so you guys can get a super close look at what I'm doing here. Sounds good. Without knocking the camera over, that'd be terrible. Cool. Is that vice on a little bit of an angle compared to the uh, camera? It is. I'm if just you're able to cast there. straight nail, probably help with the focus. Give it a minute there, it'll probably focus in. Yeah, that should be good. Just didn't want part of the fly in and part out. No, um, it's okay. Does that look nice? Yeah, yeah, it looks great. Just oh. a reminder to folks, not you, Nick, but uh, everyone else watching, um, this is an interactive uh, things. So you're more than welcome to ask questions throughout. If you are going to ask a question, uh, just use the chat box though. Uh, so keep yourself on mute. Just keep the camera on, on Nick there and avoid background noise, but drop any questions you have in the chat box and I'll just answer them as we go here. Yeah, I'd love to hear questions, guys. This is um, definitely super interactive. Um, I want to hear what you guys think. If you think, uh, I don't know, these might work for you guys, or if you have any questions about how to fish them, how to tie them, jump in anytime. Um, please. Um, so what are we going to start with? Um, I thought we'd start off with a really, really easy, easy fly to tie. Um, if you're a beginner to intermediate tire, you should be able to handle this one. Um, the, the tying of the lead eyes on is always a bit of a, a bit of a pain for, for everybody. Um, and I'll show you how I do it. Um, but aside from that, like this is basically a woolly bugger that's been really spruced up to try to, uh, imitate those crayfish. And where the origin of this fly came from uh, was I was uh, fishing the Grand. Um, I was, you know what, I wasn't uh, fishing crayfish flies. I was actually fishing a streamer and I was just like ripping the streamer, like not really thinking about what I was doing, playing that old, you know, if a bass wants to eat this thing, he's going to eat it. Um, and I'd caught a few fish on it. And then I started slowing my presentation down a little bit more um, and really started hammering on the smallmouth. And there was a material that was in the fly and it was that, um, it was a polar chenille, but it's more specifically, it was this like um, coppery colored uh, polar chenille. I know you guys carry this, Chris. Um, and uh, holy smokes, man. I don't know what it is about this, this material, but you hear a lot of people talk about confidence flies. I just have a confidence in this material. I use it in a couple of different patterns, but I really wanted to incorporate it into some kind of a buggery thing. Um, and, uh, there's a fly by fly fish food guys, uh, that they tie called a complex twist bugger, which is basically this, a woolly bugger with this stuff. Um, and, and that fly is a nice fly, but, uh, I, I wanted to make it a little bit more like a crayfish. And I think that this casts a perfect silhouette for a crayfish. So I'm gonna, I, just, I don't even have a name for it. I just call it the complex twist crayfish, I guess, but, um, it's just a, an all around great fly. So um, the hook that I have in the vise here, um, I'm not really that fussy on hooks for, for crayfish flies. Uh, a lot of different hooks will work. Um, you could be tying them on curved nymph hooks are nice. 
Um, I like to tie them on these kind of generic saltwater hooks. A lot of the times bass are, bass have a great mouth for grabbing with hooks. Um, they're a suction feeder. So if they want what you're offering, uh, they'll tend to suck in what, um, uh, the fly pattern and you're most likely going to get a good hook set on any hook really that you're using, as long as it's got an appropriate gape on it. Um, this hook here is a very generic saltwater hook. I think it's called, I don't even know how to say it. Um, the O'Shaughnessy stainless steel hook. Um, and it's by Mustad. Um, you can buy these ones in some big packs. Um, I'm pretty sure you guys sell them there at Drift, but any, any generic saltwater hook, uh, yeah. Will work for you. The code on that one, if anyone's looking for it, is the S71, I believe. Yep, sounds about yeah, right. It should be right. Yeah. And yeah. what size did you say that was? So this was a size two. Uh, it's a really small size two, though. Like it, I mean, most of my crayfish flies are going to be size four to size ten, as I was mentioning. The the length on the actual Shanka hook here is probably only equivalent to maybe a six or so. But I just really like that wide wide gape on there, so. Um, anyway, uh, thread I'm using, again, I'm not fussy about thread. Um, I buy threads in just a couple of different colors um, and they seem to do the job just fine for me, but this is just a brown six off thread. So, I mean, you can't really beat that. All right. So I'm just gonna get started lining my thread on a hook and then I'm gonna put lead eyes on this one. A lot of crayfish flies that you see, they have lead eyes. You don't have to put lead eyes on your flies. Um, you could put a, a you could use a jig head. You could be using a, a tungsten bead, uh, a cone head. It's whatever your favorite weighting uh, method is. Uh, but I'm going to use lead eyes on these. These ones here are a black. And this is a medium. Okay. So whenever you're tying lead eyes in, it's really annoying when they roll around everywhere. I'm sure you agree, Chris. Um, and it's usually a mark of a, a less experienced tire. Um, so one of the tricks to getting the lead eyes on the hook is to just build up some thread so that there's not going to be as much for it to roll around it. And what you can do is about two thirds of the way up the shank of the hook is build a ball of thread. And what you're doing by, by uh, making that ball is you're actually creating a bit of a, like a, um, uh, a seat for the eyes to sit on. And so what a lot of uh, tires do is they'll actually create two of those balls and they'll sit the eyes in between them. Now, I don't do that. It's just, this is the most time consuming part of the fly really. <laughs> and I'd rather not do two balls. I just do one. And then what I do is I'll sit the eyes on top of the hook. Now you probably can't see that because my hand's in the way. sort of sit the eyes just like that, right on top, backwards against the, the, um, the little bump on the shank of the hook. And then what I'm gonna do is I wrap this way and I'm going to pull those eyes back with my thread by wrapping three or four times, just to sort of seat it and they're, they're not gonna go anywhere now. And I'm gonna go figure eight style, about three, four, uh, maybe five times. So those are on there, but they're still gonna move. Um, that's just kind of my, my wraps to, uh, um, to take my hand away. And so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to go along the base of the eyes a couple of times while pulling tight on the thread. And that's really going to help lock those in. So that wasn't too many wraps. I usually will then just kind of throw a couple more on there just to really make sure it's not going to go anywhere. Maybe do it one more time. And aside from that, we're done. Those eyes are on there. They ain't going to go anywhere. So that's it. That's basically uh, tying some eyes in. And I'm going to have to do that a couple of times tonight, but I thought the first time maybe show it a little, a little slower in case uh, anyone out there is getting frustrated with uh, trying to tie some eyes on. So just like your typical woolly bugger or, uh, or a complex twist bugger, um, you're going to take some marabou. I really like this stuff here. This is just some like, uh, I think they call it uh, a golden brown or a lighter brown color marabou. Um, I don't even have the packaging for it anymore, but um, it's, a, it's a really nice rusty kind of color just what the crayfish are uh, are looking like um crayfish are really interesting and, and sometimes they can take on not sometimes sorry they always take on the color of the bottom um so if you're fishing a river that's really really clear or a lake that's really really clear you can bet that those crayfish are going to be a lot lighter in color um i had an opportunity to fish a lake um a couple of years ago uh with a friend of mine who's an excellent bass angler and uh, the crayfish in this lake were all almost white to gray. 
So they were so pale in color. He was smoking these fish. He's a conventional angler. He was smoking them on a, uh, um, a white and smoky color tube jig. And so I've tied some like really pale crayfish flies I really want to bring up there, but I haven't been invited back yet. So we're waiting for, waiting for the opportunity to fish those. But yeah, if you're not sure what color to tie your crayfish flies, they're usually like a brown olive or a tan. Um, just look at the bottom of the river. That's uh, the key, key thing to do for those. Um, and then even the size of the rocks can help dictate what size of crayfish. So if there's a lot of smaller rocks, you're going to find smaller crayfish. If you find huge boulders, you're going to have bigger crayfish. Um, and a lot of people don't know that. So that's a nice little, little tip. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to tie on the marabou, just like I would any other woolly bugger. I don't want a really long tail on this fly. Sometimes you see woolly buggers uh, for their stillwater fly fishing to have a giant tail at the back. And I love woolly buggers that have huge tails. Like that's how I tie my standard ones for imitating all kinds of different foods. Um, but for these crayfish flies, I, I want a shorter, um, uh, shorter tail. Because all that we're really imitating here are those claws that are being tucked in um, uh, into, the, into each other while they're swimming. So just a nice poofy little tail there. You could measure the shank of the hook. I actually tied that in a little longer than I like. So one sec. Yeah, if you're doing proportions of flies, you should measure the around the shank of the hook is enough. Don't go one and a half or two times like some of the other uh, buggers that you might see. So that looks fine to me. I just got to find my scissors. All right. And so I'm going to trim. Bring a garbage can, so I'm gonna throw my materials everywhere tonight. Okay, and that's it. That's our start to our fly. Um, so the next part of it is really where the name complex twist comes from. Uh, what we're gonna do here is I'm gonna take a hackle. This is just the cheap stuff. This is a, a woolly bugger hackle. I love grizzly hackle. Love grizzly hackle for crayfish flies. I don't know the modeling of it. Just kind of looks uh, looks like movement to me when it's being uh, pulled through the water. And I'm going to take a strand of that, um, that polar chenille that I showed you. So if you can't find this specific color, like any kind of coppery um, color polar chenille would be dynamite. You can get olive. That would be great. Um, there's like a brown uh, polar chenille color. That's a great color to use. Um, I actually tie my crayfish flies in a very light shade. So something like a tan uh, or a very light gray. Um, I'll tie them brown and I'll tie them olive. So that's the three that I kind of bounce around with. Um, and sometimes it makes a difference. Okay, so I'm just gonna tie a strand of that in. It's locked in. Can't so go I notice, I notice, Nick, you're tying it in that tail like pretty far forward, not really going back to the bend. So this is almost like you're tying this, if you call that like size six hook to begin with, maybe a, a seven or an eight. <laughs> A seven. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> Making up yeah, numbers. I mean, yeah, I mean, like you don't have to wind it down to the very back of the hook. I'm kind of, I probably should go to about where the barb is. That's basically the uh, kind of the marker that I should be using. Okay. I thought um, maybe as a strategy, use a bigger hook and get a smaller fly out of it. I do that a lot. Not so much for these. These fish aren't that picky, Chris. Uh, I don't know. You really can't go wrong uh, fishing, uh, fishing one of these things. Um, so what I'm doing, I just strip the hackle a little bit towards the, um, uh, what do you call that? The, um, towards the tip of the feather there. Um, what you can do with a lot of crayfish flies is I'll actually tie it in at the base because a crayfish tapers towards the front for this particular pattern. Most of our bulk is going to be coming from the chenille here, uh, or the polar chenille. So I'm not so worried about, about that taper, but you're going to see me do a couple other flies where I will do that. All right. Now watch how easy this is. So I hope it'll show well on the camera. What I'm going to do is take this grizzly hackle feather and I'm going to take this polar chenille and I'm going to lay the chenille, the, the core of the chenille in line with the grizzly hackle. And what I'm going to do now, I'm hoping that you can see that. Okay. My video, it's hard. I can see Chris's face, but can't see what I'm doing really. Um, so I have them aligned. Now, all that I'm going to do is I'm just going to twist them together in my fingers and it's going to make a, a brush. And I didn't bring my, my little um, uh, dubbing thing down here, but I'm just going to use my fingers. If you have a dubbing brush, just use your dubbing brush to sort of pull the fibers together. And so now what we got is a bit of a rope. And what I really like about this is that 
it's durable because now that now you don't have to worry about a rib on that hackle. Um, now that the hackle's all wrapped around the core of the uh, polar chenille, um, don't have to worry about a rib. It's more durable. And then that hackle also just tones the flash down a little bit. Sometimes I'll even put two hackles in there or put two different color hackles just for like a kind of a cool uh, effect. So if you want to throw like an all over a brown hackle in there, do it. It looks awesome. Um, and then all that I'm going to do with this is just wind that brush up the shaft of the hook and you can pull pretty hard on that and you ain't going to break that hackle. And I'm kind of just stroking those fibers as I wind, as we go up. And when I get to about here, I'll throw one wrap just in front of the, uh, the eyes there. And that's it. I'm just gonna take that thread, bind off the front. And trim, okay. I'm gonna clean my head up a little bit here. There we go. How's that look? Buggy? Pretty yeah. buggy. Yeah. All right, we're almost done. We got one more step. So right now, this fly doesn't really look like a crayfish to you guys. And it didn't really look like a crayfish to me. It's gonna invert when we fish it. So I'm actually gonna invert it in my vise right now. How's the fly? Is it in focus, Chris? Yeah. Okay. Um, I know I was bumping my vise around a little bit there. So now it's an inverted woolly bugger basically with a complex twist and oftentimes the bass that uh that you're fishing in a river situation especially on around our river situations um, is that they, they'll be pretty shallow and you'll actually be able to sight fish for these fish um in almost like bonefish style conditions and so i don't know that just triggered something in my brain of why wouldn't I fish like a bonefish type of fly to these fish? And so I don't know if anyone's ever seen the crazy Charlies and some of those like just classic bonefish flies. They're an inverted, they're on a hook like this, and they often have like a fox tail or a coyote or sorry, a fox wing or a coyote wing. Um, and so that's what I've included on this fly too. I'm actually going to reverse tie in a little bit of um, uh, Arctic fox fur. So again, I got a nice like rusty brown color Arctic fox fur, and I really love this stuff. You tie a lot with fox, Chris? Um... Maybe not as much as these two. I, I've really just, uh, steelhead flies come to like love um, raccoon, fin raccoon instead. Raccoon, okay. Just I really like coyote. coyote. I've, been, I've been fishing with coyote a lot. I got this big delta coyote and I'm almost through it now, but that's another one I really like. Got that cool natural modeling, right? Yeah, yeah. And that would look fantastic on this fly. Um, I got this like rusty brown Arctic Fox here that I'm going to use. And so I just got like a smaller chunk here. I'll wait till my, my camera's like a slower autofocus um, on this, on this uh, setting here. But you can see that's not a very big chunk. If it is a really, really huge chunk, then um, it's not going to be very good because what's going to happen is that you're going to slow down the sink rate of the fly. Um, and that, that's not what you want with a crayfish fly. These flies are supposed to be right hopped along the bottom. They shouldn't be too high in the water column. I've certainly had success stripping them up high in the water column, but that's not normally how I want to fish them. I want them in the rocks, which is another case for tying simple, easy flies. If you're not losing crayfish flies when you're fishing, then you're not fishing them correctly. Um, I tend to lose a lot in, in some of the big boulder gardens and stuff like that, but that's okay because they take two seconds to tie um, if you're not talking. Um, so I'm going to just measure up the proportions here about where I should tie this uh, fox hair in. I'm going to go just a little bit beyond the, the shank of the hook there, not much more. And then what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to tie it in pointing forward. And Arctic Fox is just one of those materials that just ties in so nice. Okay. It doesn't even take many thread wraps to bind it. If you ever follow anything that like Rich Strollis is doing with his like headbanger sculpins and, and some of the patterns that he ties, man, tying in Arctic Fox reverse style like that is very, very common. Okay, so last step for this, just take that Arctic Fox fur and push it backwards. And I'm just gonna catch that Arctic Fox a little bit and make a nice neat little thread head on there. And I didn't bring my whip finish tool down here, so I'm just gonna half hitch it. I am not so good at the hand whip finish. All right. It doesn't really matter when super glue exists. Nope, 
No, and that's a good point. I was going to mention that on my next fly here, but uh, if you want to use some uh, uh, some uh, super glue or you want to use some um, uh, head cement or whatever your favorite product is to do, throw it on that fly. These things are durable. You're not going to, I've never had a fish destroy one of these. Um, maybe if you caught a ton of fish on it, uh, maybe some of those fibers might get a little chewed up, but I just think the fly works better when that happens, to be honest. Um, so that's it. That's what I call my complex twist crayfish. It's a super easy bass fly. You can crank out a whole row of these in your fly box. Uh, I promise you that will catch smallmouth bass in the Grand River. That is a dynamite, dynamite little fly. Um, but yeah, any questions about tying that thing? I see chats popping up there. Yeah, um, nothing specific to that fly that came up, but definitely some questions here. Um, one, just... Uh, I guess, relating to this fly, but also just crayfish in general. Do you mess around with rattles at all? So I've been trying to find some rattles. I haven't yet. Most of these flies I think are too small for a rattle. I think you'd have to tie a, a little bigger of a, uh, of a fly for that. Um, but it's on my radar. I can't speak on personal experience, but I really, really want to. Um, if you could let me know where you find rattles, that'd be very nice because I would like to try that. For sure. We do stock some in the shop. You maybe, have some? Maybe on the bigger sizes, it's like you're, like this one, maybe you can squeeze one in there, but I can see what you mean about being a little tight. Yeah. Yeah. I want to, I want a little bit of a um, smaller rattle if I was going to throw one on a little sure. bit of five in this. So this is the olive version. I got the olive version right there beside yeah. it. Yeah. I, I love that too. I just love all of like, just looks like a crayfish. <laughs> And, and that might not look like a crayfish to you. And when you put it in the water though, and all of those fibers are, are uh, kind of slicking back when you pulse it, and then they kind of, when you relax it, they undulate like that. It's a banger of a crayfish fly. So that's our first one. Very cool. A couple other, just like um, more general catfishing questions on, on that that we had come in. Uh, Nicole is asking, how valid is the assertion that if a river has, a cray has crayfish, that the water quality is good, I guess? relaying it to seeing things like stone flies and using those as a, a water quality indicator. Yeah, I would say that it's probably a very, very good indicator. Uh, there's actually a real, I mean, I'm not a, I'm not a scientist on this um, at all, um, but there's actually a real big problem with uh, crayfish becoming extinct from a lot of the watersheds in the, in the States, mm -hmm. um, which is a real shame. Um, sometimes that has to do with uh, their life cycle Oh, I'm losing my uh, focus here. Yeah, so. I think if you pop a hook in there or fly yeah. back in the vice, you're you talking, I might lock on. It's trying to find my face or something. Yeah, um, yeah like if, um, if there's things that are going on in the water that are affecting the crayfish's ability to, um, uh, to develop its shell, which I used to know what uh, that mineral was called that it needed. I don't know if you know, Chris, but um, it's why the streams in Pennsylvania have so many scuds and sow bugs in them. Um, they actually need certain um minerals in the water to build their shell um and there's a real problem with some rivers in the states that uh that that's somehow getting messed up um and their crayfish populations are really suffering um and crayfish are definitely a good indicator species though for for water quality um we do find them in areas of the river that uh, that don't have like high water quality so like um, they're not necessarily like a brook trout that needs that super oxygenated water. Uh, crayfish love warm water. Um, that's actually something that I was going to get into when I talk a little more about fishing these flies. Um, is I typically fish these when it's warmer out. So our bass season here in Ontario, uh, we're opening our bass season up towards the end of June, right at that like kind of I'd call early summer. That's right when the heat is coming up. Trout season is now getting slow. The trout are now getting you know, they're becoming a little stressed with the water temperatures climbing. Um, the crayfish, just like the bass, their metabolism then kind of starts to rise with rising water temperatures. And actually what happens to these crayfish is that they, um, uh, they start to molt more frequently when the water temperature is higher. They actually are growing more. So they're outgrowing their shell and they're particularly vulnerable when they're going through that molting stage. There's a lot been written about a fish's preference to eat crayfish going in that molten stage because it's like a soft shell crab or uh, maybe a delicacy to them. Um, from my own personal observations, they like crayfish all the time and not even if they're molting, especially if they're of a certain size, but uh, um, certainly the activity level as we approach early summer and into the into the warmer temperatures of midsummer, um, that kicks the crayfish's um, metabolism activity levels into overdrive. 
And so right as you're starting to think about bass, the bass are starting to think about crayfish. Um, when the weather gets cool, when the weather, uh, water temperatures start dropping below 50 degrees, crayfish start to go into hiding into the rocks and they start to really slow down their metabolism. So they're less available to the fish. And uh, that's really when I'm going to start fishing bait fish flies and, and things that look like, uh, you know, more like a sculpin or a, a darter um, or even some of the um, like creek chubs and things like that, that the bass will be feeding on as they approach late fall. Yep. Yeah. Cool. Um, one other point maybe on Nicole's question would be, I'm definitely not an expert in this, but um, it, it might vary a little between species too. Um, there's probably similar, my guess would be environmental factors. Um, like I said, I, I can't think of that uh, mineral off the top of my head either, which is unfortunate. Is it calcium carbonate? Calcium carbonate? Is it? Okay. So Could be. It's, it's isn't plausible. CaCO3, isn't that what it is? Yeah. Definitely sounds plausible. <laughs> but uh, so that. It, <laughs> that might affect um, all, all crayfish, but if you're talking about other environmental factors like the presence, uh, presence of um, invasives, then you know, species might be an indicator too, I suppose. I don't know. Well, and I'll tell you what, if you're actually really interested in the biology of crayfish, there is a gentleman who runs a Twitter account. Um, I had the opportunity of meeting him and talking to him all about crayfish. And uh, he's not an angler, but he's uh, very passionate about crayfish. And he's, uh, uh, I mean, without knowing his credentials exactly, I would just say that he's like the, um, uh, the expert in crayfish in Ontario. Um, and you can follow him on Twitter and his name is Dr. Crayfish. And he's very open to anyone who wants to ask questions about crayfish. So if you're interested in the actual biology of crayfish, there's your guy. So go find him on Twitter our social media. Awesome. We had a couple other questions about fishing these flies, but maybe we'll hop into another fly and then address All some right. in between. Okay. So I really struggled with whether or not I should tie this fly for everybody. And the reason why is because it's not very impressive. It's, it's an old fly and somebody gave this to me maybe 20 years ago. And they told me that this was an absolute killer fly. And I bet you, I didn't fish it for at least 10 years after I, someone told me about this fly and it's because it was so unimpressive. So my focus is lost again, because I don't have something on the hook. Anyway, it's, I should have known right away that it was a good pattern because it's essentially Bob Clouser's uh, classic Clouser crayfish. Um, and when you, when you see them, if you Google it, or, you know, you uh, you're looking online or something like that, you're going to see flies that look like this. Okay, they got the furry foam back. That's kind of the modern version of a Clouser crayfish. Awesome fly. I have lots of these. I love them. Um, but the turkey tail offers something a little bit differently. Um, the next fly I'm going to tie is using that furry foam as well. The third fly I'm going to tie. Um, and so this one, I wanted to show you the original fly because it's a really, really great fly for really clear water. And when you're fishing those fish that are in shallow and you can sight fish them just like something like a bonefish or, uh, um, or something like the, on the saltwater flats. So I'd highly recommend keep a few very natural presentation, uh, very natural looking crayfish flies, um, because there will be times that you run into that you don't want that big rabbit soaked fly and you want something tight, something that'll sink, um, and something that'll, uh, look really, really natural to the fish. Uh, and so we're going to tie that one. All right. A couple of neat tricks on this one. I've got some pheasant tail here. I'm sure everybody has pheasant tail. The other, the other really good thing about the slides, I'm sure everybody has, has the materials to tie it. So it's not like you have to get anything super exotic and, and fancy. Did you say which uh, hook that was you had in there? I didn't because you could use anything. Um, this is your num like standard size six, 3X long streamer hook. So, um, I'm not even sure which one this one is, but, uh, uh, it's your standard streamer hook. You could use anything though. Uh, Chris, you know, the hook models better than I do. Um, so maybe you want to ramble some out that, uh, that would meet that criteria, but it's like the most common hook <laughs> I think that you could find. <laughs> I kind of like the generic. <laughs> Eric description. Uh, whatever anyone, yeah, whatever anyone comes up. Uh, must add R73 is a 3XL streamer hook though. So, and that's probably what it is. I, I bought this hook from you guys, Chris. I don't know if you can see that very well there. Um, I love this hook. This is a size six as well. I think it's, it's Doihuku. Doihiku. I don't know how to say it, but oh, these are wicked. Okay. So 
what are we going to start with? This flies super natural materials, uh, not very many synth synthetics at all in this one. Um, we're going to start with pheasant tail. So I'm sure everybody's got some pheasant tail. Don't use your fancy, fancy pheasant tail on this one. It doesn't have to be dyed or anything like that. Just your run of the mill pheasant tail. I'm using some of the darker fibers here. Um, and all that I'm going to do is tie some antennae in about that length of the hook shank here. Sorry, I'm actually going to weight it. Let's weight this one. You don't have to tie it weighted, but I'm going to weight it. Okay, so I'm going to layer a little bit of thread down. Just something for that wire to grip onto. This is uh, a 0.25 lead wire. You can use lead free wire as well. And I'm just going to go all the way down the hook shank here. I just use my thumbnail to break it off. Okay. All right, I'm just gonna run my thread over the top here, just so it doesn't go anywhere. That'd be embarrassing. All right. Uh, sorry, Nick, to interrupt. Um, focus is really coming in and out there. Um, yeah, that might help. Or I'm wondering if uh, maybe the last fly is more centered in frame, if that was why I wasn't moving around. You're right on the autofocus uh, point. Is it, is it yeah. focusing there? It's, yeah, it's better. Once I get some meat on the hook, it'll be on there. It'll be a little easier. All right. So I'm going to just do what I did last time there. Measure up the length of the, um, uh, the shank of the hook here. All right. And that's it. We got some antenna. Next up, we're going to use our turkey. Um, I don't have too much of this left, but this is just a, a turkey tail feather. So your Ozark turkey, like what you'd use on a mother minnow or a wing case for some of your stoneflies or anything like that. And I'm just going to cut a piece that's about, oh, I'd say between a quarter to a half an inch in, uh, in width there. And I only have a small piece of it left, so I can't mess this up. And I'm going to tie it in just like you would a wing case on, um, uh, on a nymph, basically. And there, that's in. All right. And so again, in theme of just trying to make this a fly accessible for everybody, um, I'm going to use a little bit of yarn here. Um, this is just like a grayish yarn that I have. Um, I have oodles of this and will never run out because I don't know if somebody gave me some yarn for fly time. Um, and so I'm going to use a gray yarn. You can use a uh, hair's ear dubbing or really any lighter color dubbing that you like. Um, it doesn't really matter as long as it's a little bit lighter than, um, uh, than the wing case there, or the care space. So I'm going to tie that yarn in across the top here, and now it's in. Okay, so now what I'm going to do is I'm just going to wind that yarn up, and I'm going to build an underbody a little bit thicker towards the, uh, the back end of the hook here, because that's kind of our care space of the, of the crayfish. I'm actually going to go backwards, and I'm going to build it up. There. That's good enough. And so I'm going to use this yarn again. You could just leave it on here. I'm actually just going to trim it because it's going to be in the way when I'm trying to show you guys what I'm doing next. But you could definitely just leave that on there. Okay. Now I've had this old uh, Indian saddle or uh, hen hen saddle for some time. If you don't have any brownish modeled uh, soft hackle, you should get some. Hungarian partridge would work. Uh, pheasant would work. Any webby kind of feather would be just fine for this. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to take one of those feathers here and I'm going to preen off all that fluffy stuff. And I'm going to use that to make the claws. And you can get fancy. You can cut a little wedge in that, that, uh, that uh, feather there. And what that would do is make it look a little bit more like a claw. I'm gonna have to turn the fly a little bit so I can see what I'm doing. And I want those claws to sit alongside the body, but I like them to kind of not splay out too much. That looks good. 
if you can see how I have that feather. Can you see how it's, uh, how it's sitting on the hook there? You could take some time with it, sort of uh, work the feather around the hook to, to sit how you would like it to. So again, I'm tying it in by the, by the stem here after I've cleaned off everything else. And you really want your claws to be as close as possible to the same size. There we go. By the same size, I don't mean the same like width. I mean more so the same length, like um, like the same length off the back shank of the hook. And those are sitting a little too pretty for me. It's not a wing of a spinner. It's a they're supposed to be crayfish claws, so they should kind of go like that. There we go. I'm happy with that. See how they're sitting like that? That's what I'm looking for. Okay. Now, I haven't touched that wing case yet, and I'm not going to touch it. I'm just going to leave it there. I'm going to get my rib material next, which is just a simple piece of tippet. This is 3X tippet. And that's going to be my rib for the fly. So what I'm going to do is tie that piece of tippet along the shank of the hook. And then I left a little piece here. I'm just going to fold it back. What that's going to do is this stuff loves to slip whenever you tie tippet in as a rib. And so that's just going to prevent me from, because it's really annoying when you finish your whole fly or almost finish your whole fly. And then you go to rib and the tippet just flies right out of your hand. That's not very much fun at all. Then you got to restart over. Okay. Now I'm going to take another piece of that same yarn I was using before. Or again, if you want to, you can just dub the body. It really doesn't matter. The fish don't care. And then the last thing I'm going to tie in is one of those, uh, I'm going to use again, that grizzly hackle that I used on that, um, that first fly. But again, you could use a brown hackle. You could use a, an olive hackle or a tan hackle, whatever you'd like. And this is going to be the actual legs that are sitting underneath the crayfish. Um, if you guys um, saw the other fly where it was actually inverted, this fly is not going to be inverted. This fly is actually going to be fished um, as it's sitting in the vise right now. And so with this pattern, I'm actually going to tie it in at the, um, the base of the feather first, because I want those thicker fibers to be towards the head of the fly. And I'm actually gonna use that stem just to build up bulk in the middle of the fly here. Crayfish are, are thick. They like to, um, it's no problem if you want to, uh, to build a little bit of bulk into it. It's a good idea. Okay. All right, let me touch this yarn. All I'm gonna do is you're gonna take your dubbing or your yarn or whatever you got, and you're just gonna wrap it up the shank. A little bit of a taper is, is nice. Is it really important? Probably not. All right. Make sure I got no gaps of lead wire poking through. That wouldn't look very nice. Okay. How's my autofocus now, Chris? Is it a little better? Yeah, the last one I think was um, still all better for whatever reason. I don't know why, but yeah, no, it, since he got about halfway through, it's been fine. Okay, you know what it is? It just need a little bit of something to focus on. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Okay. Awesome. So I'm just gonna wrap that hackle now up just like you would a woolly bugger. All right. Couple of wraps to secure it. And now it's looking wild. All right. Last step, you take that, uh, that turkey that we tied in way back at the beginning, and we're gonna pull it all the way over the top, just like that. I don't know if you guys can see that. That's like a stonefly, essentially, or uh, any kind of nymph, really. And lock that sucker down. Okay. Okay. So it's looking pretty wild right now. That hackle is uh, really poking out um, the sides pretty good. 
But what we're going to do is we're going to take that rib and we're going to bind the rest of this down. And we're going to bind those legs down. And as I'm turning turning the, um, uh, the, the tippet as a rib, I'm just going to kind of use my fingers to sort of angle some of those, those fibers. So I'm actually pushing them towards the, the back of the hook, just like a crayfish's legs would go when, it, when they're swimming. Not a lot, you don't want it all kind of caught down, but just something that gives it a little bit of an angle because you don't, you don't need them to be uh, like super, super forward. And I kind of like the way that looks. There we go, that's pretty good. I have a look here. I, think, I can't see what you guys are seeing, so. Okay, and you'll notice that I didn't trim that tail. And I'm gonna trim it a little bit, but that's gonna be the actual crayfish tail. We're gonna leave that. Okay. A little closer here. Does that look like a crayfish? I don't know, to me that looks like a crayfish. It's pretty bang on, yeah. I think so. I think it's super natural. And this is uh, a nice fly that will work for lots of different species. Um, it is not as durable as that last one that I tied. Um, that last one that I tied is pretty much bomb proof, but because of that turkey tail that we got going on, even though it is bound down with the rib, um, it's not nearly as durable as the other one. So what you might want to do, if you're tying these for bass, um, I would definitely hit these with uh, maybe a little bit of UV, or you hit them with um, some of that um, uh, head cement or Sally Hansen's or whatever your preferred uh, head cement is. Um, but I don't do that. So what I often do with this fly is I kind of keep this one in reserve in my fly box for those times too that I, if I run into a carp um, while I'm fishing. It's a really nice slow sinking crayfish. Um, you can really get it into that zone where, where river carp um, where are going to be sitting and feeding in some of the little back bays and things like that. Um, and I don't put head cement on my carp flies. I'm not sure if, uh, if you do, Chris, if you have any experience with that. Um, but whenever carp have a very sensitive, um, um, uh, what do you call it, nervous system. And I've been told that they can smell things very, very well. And so a lot of really, really good carp anglers out there, they are refusing to put uh, head cement on their flies. And I've sort of followed suit because I find carp very hard to catch. And anything that I can put into my uh, uh, stack guys in my favor, I'm going to do it. You put head yeah. cement on carp flies? So I, I probably don't have the carp fishing history personally to justify it, but no. I oh, don't. what you're saying is you don't like carp. No, I love carp. Carp don't like me. <laughs> me, you and me both, I, man. Yeah, I mean, I, I've certainly caught them on the fly, but um, no, I haven't devoted enough time to them badly. But no, I, I, I'm on board with the, the no head cement thing. In fact, a lot of trout flies, um, I, I don't head cement. I think super glue is a little less smelly, um, at least to me. So mm -hmm. I, I'm a little less nervous about that, but yeah, I'm, I'm a little picky sometimes about where I use it. Interesting. Interesting. I, I do use it on my trout flies. Um, I use it definitely on my streamers. Cause if I'm spending this time tying a streamer, I want it to be, yeah. uh, be durable. Usually it's yeah. More, more nymphs that I'm looking at it a little yep. skeptically where it's a little bit slower presentation and yeah, yeah. even then, um, like usually super blue. Yeah. I, I don't put on my dry flies. I don't know why. I think it's cause I just find my dry flies durability is not as, as key of a factor. I'm not usually uh, fishing an entire day with a dry fly per se. Sure. Although you definitely can. Um, but yeah, that is the Clouser crayfish. Again, you can tie that with the furry foam. Um, so here's the one with the furry foam that I have. I got some eyes on this one. I went kind of crazy and put the little beady eyes on the sucker. And um, the furry foam makes it a bulkier fly. Um, this is a great pattern. I... I have tons and tons of these flies, uh, both with the furry foam and without. And again, something I have just tons of confidence in. It took me forever to finally fish this one. Um, and when I did, I was really, really glad to have found it and to have kept it in my box all those years because it's a really, really good fly for those super clear water, uh, shallower fish that you might find. Yeah. And do you have any tips on like how to fish that? Like that one, presumably you're not trying to, you know, drag along bottom so much. It's more of like a swimming pattern or... No, exactly. Um, this thing with that, those claws that are kind of like this, they kind of function like a parachute. So it does sink, but it's going to sink kind of slower. 
I don't know if you've ever seen the crayfish when, uh, if you just took one and threw it out there and it wants to go down to the bottom, they kind of parachute down, right? If they want to get to the bottom, they don't really swim down to the bottom. They swim when they're in a panic, but when they're actually like just kind of hovering down, I feel like that's what this looks like. And I, I feel like that's maybe why it's a decent carp fly. Um, again, I'm not a super big carp angler, um, but if I see them, I'm going to try to catch them. And this is probably what I'm going to throw on if I'm in a river. Um, that, but the, uh, the smallmouth, they also respond very, very well to that, like very kind of um, small radius, cast it within three feet of the fish and let that, that thing just kind of drift down slowly. Uh, fish in the drop more. The other thing is I've caught a lot of fish on this under an indicator. So yeah. split shot, a couple inches up the line um, and dead drifting this thing. Um, I don't know if it looks like a dead crayfish, but I think it's very natural. I think if the fish have been um, hit pretty hard with pressure, uh, where I like to fish a lot on the Grand, there's a lot of tubers and, uh, you know, even conventional anglers that come through there. Um, I think that sometimes are very slow, naturally drifting flies, sometimes the ticket. When you got these heavy lead eyes on, on some of these flies, um, like the last one I tied, they're going to jig, right? So they're really going to do that jigging action. That's one action. When you have an unweighted fly, and even if I were to strip this fly, it's going to strip and then it's going to slowly sink down like that. And then it's going to strip and slowly sink down. It's a very different presentation. And so even though we're fishing crayfish or fishing flies that, you know, they're about the same size, how you weight your flies is absolutely essential to how the fish are going to respond to it. There's days when they don't want a jigging action, right? Um, and I think this applies to all your fishing, like how you weight your flies is probably more important than the actual pattern itself. Yep. Right. And like speaking from a trout perspective too, that's definitely true as well. So. Oh, hundred percent. Okay. We're going to do my favorite one now. I saved the best for last. And I got a whole bunch of other flies here that I'm going to show you that I'm not going to tie because we said we do three, um, but I'm going to show you a couple other flies that are just in my, my smallmouth box. You might notice that I just keep talking about rivers, right? So I'm, I'm saying rivers a lot. There's no reason why these wouldn't work on lakes. Um, myself, personally, I don't fish crayfish flies as much on lakes. They do work. Um, I have caught fish on crayfish flies on lakes, um, but for me, most of my crayfish fishing is going to be in rivers for river bass. Uh, I think they're just such an important food source for those fish. What I would do differently, um, where I have had a lot of success uh, fishing uh, these types of things, is at river mouths. Um, and not river mouths where there's necessarily current. I'm talking like a slow creek mouth um, where I can use a sink tip line or a sinking line and really crawl a lightly weighted crayfish back to myself along a drop off coming up. Because these need to be in the bottom. We're not we don't want to be fishing huge drop-offs. It's just really challenging to fish a huge drop-off and have your crayfish fly down around the bottom in 20 feet of water. Um, there, there's some crazy sinking lines out there that might allow you to do that, um, but it's a lot more challenging. So um, fishing something like these, like I'm tying right now, bigger in a lake, um, I find works better. Um, and uh, I think it's just easier for those fish in still water to find, uh, to find that fly. Um, you can, you can have really, really, really good days doing that. But, um, for me, I love river bass. I think they're, they behave very similar to, similarly to trout a lot of the time. Um, and, uh, and you can apply a lot of those same principles and there's just something about walking a super warm river on like a July, end of July day. It's just super nice. All right. Now we'll do the, the favorite. So most of the stuff that I've learned, I'm not a fishing guide. Um, I fish a heck of a lot, but um, I, I am not a guide. Um, I know some really, really wonderful guides that are um, that are excellent, excellent smallmouth bass anglers. So um, I don't want to take credit for for so any of the stuff that I'm doing uh, here tonight. It all really uh, comes down to some people that have been. Uh, very nice and willing to share information with me. Um, and um, 
I think that a lot more anglers are really missing out by not giving smallmouth bass a fair shake. Um, I think that our sport, especially around Ontario here, we're very trout focused, um, but we have some wonderful smallmouth bass opportunities. And, and there are some, some fishing guides that would love to take you out for that kind of thing. Um, and, and I've had the opportunity to fish with some of them. And uh, so that's where a lot of my, my knowledge and a lot of that plus taking what I've learned from them uh, into other places. So I don't want to say that I'm taking credit and saying these are my fly patterns. I mean, these are the last one I tied was Bob Clouser's uh, fly pattern. Um, but this one here was made by um, uh, Steve May and Ken Collins at, at Trout Fitters. They shared that fly with me a number of years ago. And this has definitely been my favorite and fly. And there's just something about getting into local flies, local guys tying local patterns for our local waters, um, I think is something that makes uh, uh, kind of the regionality of fly fishing and fly tying really special. Um, so I'm going to tie the full, full motion crayfish. I'm not sure if anyone's ever heard of that fly before uh, or had the opportunity to fish it, but it's just an absolute awesome, awesome crayfish fly. And this one plus Dave Whitlock's uh, crayfish, um, are just two more just perfect crayfish flies in my opinion. So let's get started. I, because I have this uh, pack of hooks beside me, I'm gonna tie it on that same hook again. Uh, so that's the uh, O'Shaughnessy stainless steel hook. Uh, I think it was S71. Um, this is of the mustad variety. The original pattern is tied on a curved nymph hook. Um, I love curved nymph hooks, but this one's just a little bit bigger, a little bit easier to see. My autofocus will like it a little better. Um, so we're gonna tie it on this one, um, but again, this fly, awesome on any hook, size four to size uh, 10. Uh, if you're gonna tie one size, I would say tie size six. If you're gonna tie a couple sizes, maybe tie a size four and then also tie a size eight. So you have kind of that variety. Um, or just be crazy like me and tie four, six, eight, 10, tie all. <laughs> okay, so again, we're gonna go with those small little eyes. So bear with me here while I just tie these eyes on. Sorry, I'm mute. Um, maybe as you're doing that, you could walk us through. Um, so you mentioned, yeah, you mess around with like different lines depending on depth and stuff you're trying to target. Dave was wondering, do you have like a particular kind of leader setup that you like for fishing crayfish? Oh yeah, I definitely do. It's really technical. It's usually about something like eight to ten pound of just straight, like either Maxima or uh, any kind of tippet material. Um, that's I don't even use fluorocarbon. Um, I don't know if you ever knew Ian Colin James, uh, uh, Chris, if you ever had the chance of meeting him before, uh, but he's a well-known angler that uh, also did fish a lot of smallmouth bass in our rivers. And his system, I think, was just eight pound maxima. That was his bass leader. And uh, I've kind of adopted that because it's simple. It sinks really well um, and it works really well. It's a really good idea to tie a butt section uh, on the end. So um by all means throw a butt section on there to, to help propel it out but uh, these flies they cast really easily they're not very heavy um and uh you'll build just fine of just running like a, a straight level level leader um what i do like though is i like quite a long leader so um a lot of times people who are streamer fishing are fishing like a seven foot leader um i love something you know 10 foot 12 foot because some of the deep holes i want to get down there um, and I'm doing it on a floating line. Uh, typically, if it's um, uh, river bass fishing on the Grand, really fun fishing those fish with a five weight because there is a lot of smaller fish. And then there's also some big lunkers down there that it's kind of nice to really bend that five weight over to the cork. But um, I'd say the best all around rod would be a six weight. Um, if I'm on a river with some bigger fish, if I'm fishing the Saugeen, uh, Maitland or some of those rivers, you know, a seven weights, like the ultimate tool for river bass, like can't go wrong with a six or a seven weight. Um, if you're going into the grand, uh, I, I just like a light rod sometimes for, um, you know, just messing around with those smaller fish. Cause, um, you can go out there, you might hit one of those huge, huge smallmouth on the grand, but if you're, you can have a, just a wonderful day. I don't even want to throw numbers out there. Cause sometimes it feels like a fish every cast. Um, and even if they're 12, 14, 16 inch smallmouth, I don't care. That sounds fine. That's fine by me. For me, like fishing these river bass on, on crayfish, it's not so much about like, like trophy hunting. That's kind of how, uh, how the fall bass fishing goes. It's more about, you know, hot summer's day, getting out onto a river, trout season, it's kind of slowing down a little bit. You get a huge chunk of river all to yourself. You're not really, I never really see too many people when I go uh, bass fishing. 
uh, on our local watersheds. And uh, you can just have such a nice, just a nice wholesome time fishing. That's, I don't know, that sounds sort of corny, but um, it's just a nice way to spend an evening, a summer's evening or, or whatnot. Yeah. I would also encourage anyone who's getting into the sport or like maybe you've been doing it for a few years and those stupid brown trout are just driving you mental and you need a little bit of like a confidence, like pick me up uh, and some, some good, uh, some good experience fighting fish, head on out to some of the rivers that, that, you know, have smallmouth bass because um, they can be quite cooperative and, um, and it's just a good way to kill the time. Yeah. And like you say, they, they become kind of trouty in rivers, right? They, they relate to the same kind of structure and, um, you know, eat a lot of the same food and stuff. So, you know, if, even if you just want practice, maybe not fishing crayfish, but fishing, uh, you know, just your dry fly game or work on your new thing and stuff like those fish will eat that kind of stuff too. So it's good practice. They will. They will. There's almost always, there's almost always a couple that are going to eat it. Even if you feel like you're doing everything wrong. And, um, the biggest advice I give new anglers all the time is, you know, don't go to the most high pressure, difficult technical water and learn how to fly fish. Like I did. And I spent a lot of years not catching fish, at least not catching fish consistently. And so it was very frustrating um when i first started out but um yeah if you head on out to some of the small bass rivers you'll likely find some that are gonna that are gonna bite and you know you get all that practice in setting the hook and things like that um but i also just want to say that like those real big fish man they're old they're like 25 well a really big fish that's like 20 inch smallmouth they can be 15 to 25 years old from what i understand so they're really old fish and they're smart and they don't just take anything. Um, you need to really have your presentation dialed. So um, I also, a lot of anglers, especially trout anglers sort of say, oh, you know, bass, they're easy. Not the big ones. Those big boys are uh, just as technical as any brown trout that I've ever seen. Absolutely, good good chance to throw in there as well. Um, you know, uh, in terms of like keeping fish as well, keep in mm. mind that, uh, yeah, some of those, those older fish are seriously old and seriously slow growing so yeah we have a trophy we have multiple trophy fisheries here in, in Ontario and in our rivers for for bass like I I, I couldn't think of a better place to, that you would want to go to fish smallmouth bass than than southern Ontario here uh, southern central Ontario mind you but yeah there's often not special regulations in these places and so releasing these fish is like absolutely essential to if you ever want to enjoy them in the future um, yep that's the like yeah. you know gotta gotta yeah, talk about speed. conservation right yeah. all right so favorite tie for my favorite crayfish fly here um this is um uh the, the trout fitter fly or the full full motion crayfish as i mentioned um and so we're going to do the same thing that we started with uh on the, on the last pattern and we're going to use that pheasant tail again so this is going to be our antennae i'm going to put them a little longer this time but again roughly about the length of the, the hook shank here. All right. And I'm actually gonna go down the bend of the hook a little bit. So you see what I did there? It's just down the, the bend and they're pointing up a little bit. So that's the antennae. Now what I'm gonna do is just sort of take a little bit of orange rabbit fur. Um, you could use like a hot orange or this is a rusty orange. And what I'm doing with this is this is just gonna be the mouth parts to our little crayfish. So this one's a little bit more involved of a fly, but I think it's the right amount of involved. So I'm just going to leave that little hoof of rabbit, not as long as the antennae, I'd say about halfway down the antennae. And we're going to tie that in. All righty. And just in case someone's watching this and they don't tie, I think you guys sell this one at the shop. Do you not? We do, yeah. We've gotten some tied for the shop. I, yeah, I think we have some in stock right now. Yeah, so, I, I saw, saw that. And I was like, oh, that's cool. They're actually, you guys are carrying some very local fly patterns. That's amazing. There's something, there's something that gets lost uh, in the days of the internet when you can, you know, get anything from anywhere. Like back in the day, it used to be that you could only get local patterns from from local shops, and that that was your source for for uh, the flies that work on your own water. And uh, I don't know, I think it's really special to, to be able to fish flies like this and to kind of even learn some of their histories. But so that's the uh, kind of the mouth parts and the antennae to this crayfish fly. Um, you could get really fancy and you could put little black eyes on there. And I think that looks great, but uh, we're not gonna do that tonight because tonight's about fishing a, a practical fly. And I don't wanna scare anybody away 
who thinks, oh, I can't tie this fly because I don't have black eyes. I don't think it matters one bit to the fish. So now for the kind of the, one of the defining parts to this fly, this is furry foam. Furry foam, um, there's a couple different manufacturers that make it. Um, this is the light olive color. Um, I also really like it in tan, brown. There's like a rusty um, kind of colored one that looks uh, very nice for crayfish. Um, but I think my favorite is probably this light olive color. Um, and it's stretchy on one side and it's not stretchy on the other side. So you wanna take note of that because when we're tying this, this shell back or care space in over the top of the crayfish, uh, we're gonna stretch it a little bit. So you wanna be cutting your strip off of it um, so you can take advantage of that. So I'm gonna cut a strip and I'm gonna say it's about maybe about a quarter. Nah, that's probably about closer to a half inch. So it's a pretty thick strip that I'm, that I'm cutting here. So you can see that there. And again, I cut it so that I can stretch it. And this stuff's cool, man. Like when it gets wet, it like really, really, really keeps the bulk of a fly, keeps the bulk of a crayfish fly, especially. Um, and uh, yeah, and it looks great and, and, it, and it really absorbs the water. So it even gives you a little bit of a bonus weight when you're, uh, when you're fishing in. I don't think it adds too much buoyancy. So this is kind of a tricky part, but I'm gonna just take the, the furry foam and I'm gonna try to keep my hands out of the way so you guys can see. Uh, you can't really see, can you? Should be able to see enough. Okay, so I'm just kind of folding it over the, the shank of the hook here, just to tie it in. And so this stuff ties in really nice too, by the way. It's not something that's like gonna move around everywhere. I'm just trying to keep it centered. And that's why I'm moving it back and forth around that hook, because I wanna keep it centered. Okay, that went pretty good. All right, able to see that okay? Mm -hmm. Good. All right. And so I like rubber legs on this one. Most crayfish flies do have rubber legs. Um, I think I'm going to go with the all of rubber legs on this one. Doesn't matter. Pumpkin, also awesome. Fishing some pumpkin legs. Really good, uh, good idea. And I'm going to put the three. I'm going to put four bands of rubber legs. Okay, so that's the, these are grizzly, grizzly legs in an olive color. I'm going to bring my thread, keep my vice, bring my thread back over here. And so unlike a lot of crayfish flies, they're going to have the legs like this kind of at the front end or whatever. These are actually going to go towards the, the, um, uh, towards the tail of the fly. Um, and the rationale behind that is when crayfish swim, their legs, they all kind of close in together, right? And so it doesn't really matter that the legs aren't where they are anatomically on the, uh, on the actual bug themselves. And so I'm just gonna wrap it around the hook like that. And one just broke, that's fine. And then tie it in. All right, that looks fine to me. And they're really long, so I'm gonna trim them. And I'm going to go just a little bit beyond the, um, the antennae of the, you probably can't see it because of that free foam. Here's the antennae. I'm going to go beyond the antennae um, and cut them right about there. And so now we got a very bassy looking fly, do we not? Okay. Now what makes this fly the actual full motion crayfish is of course something that will add a little bit of motion. So I love gold variant rabbit strips. For crayfish, they're they're they got that like natural color at the base. They got a very orangey color on the uh, on the tips. They really look like the colors of uh, of a crayfish's claws. And so that's what we're going to use here today. Got some beside me here. I'll show you after. But they got um, got some olive ones and things too. Again, the world is your oyster here. You can tie these things in any color that you like. But I like this color. Okay. So what I'm going to do. This can be a tricky part, but I'm just going to tie that rabbit hide. I like to tie it on the top of the hook here. I have a little too much there. Okay. And I'll show you why. Uh, 
or at least as close to the top as you can get it. It's for when I go to wrap it forward. There we go. Cool. All right, we're almost done this fly. So now what I'm gonna do is we're actually gonna wrap this rabbit all the way to the front of the hook. So um, whenever you're palmering rabbit strip like this, um, it can be a little bit tricky and uh, Chris, you could probably help me out with the terminology of it all. But when you're like palmering it and wrapping it around the hook, um, you really want to be laying that hide side by side all the way to the very front. Um, if you wrap over top, you might get some of the hair that gets kind of stuck underneath the hide and you're going to see the hide and it just doesn't look as nice. So hopefully I don't do that here. Um, but what I'm going to do is I'm just going to palmer that rabbit strip all the way to the front. And I've actually brought my bobbin to the front of the, um, what you call it, to the front of the eye of the hook here. So just like we were tying hackles in before, we're now doing with this rabbit strip. And what I'm doing is laying the hide side by side and all the way to the front there. And just to um, clarify, Nick, that's a, a straight cut zonk or not a cross cut strip, right? Yeah, this is a straight cut. A cross cut would work better, would it not, Chris? I'm not sure, because you're going to need that hair for the claws, right? So, so it needs to stick out a bit, right? True. true. So I never buy cross cut uh, zonker strips because I feel like they're a little bit more limited in their application. Mm -hmm. um, and so I always use straight cut and it, it palmers fine like this. Yeah. But I only, so I only went up to the eyes here. Um, I didn't go past the eyes and you don't have to. This will be fine. So I'm just gonna lock that rabbit in there, make sure it doesn't go anywhere. You don't have to tie it in that good because we're now gonna go backwards with our um, with our thread. There we go. I got that. That doesn't look like a crayfish at all. <laughs> that looks like uh, a big ball of fuzz. Okay. So next thing to do is we're actually gonna just tie all of that rabbit that we just tied in backwards. So I'm gonna throw three ribs on there like that. So that I'm just pushed all of that, that rabbit for that way. And we've kind of got a nice little bulky midsection to this fly now. And now what I'm gonna do, is I'm just gonna take that, uh, that furry foam and I'm gonna leave it bulky. So I'm not gonna stretch it on, uh, on this part. I'm just going to tie it in, in the, in, the, in the width that I have cut it. Hopefully you can see that. And then as I now bring my thread forward and rib the fly, I'm gonna pull that, uh, that furry foam and hopefully get a nice little bit of a taper going on. So it's gonna look a little more like a, the body of a crayfish. So there's one and I'll throw two wraps over top of that. And then now I'm just gonna pull it again. I'm gonna go right behind the eyes and do a couple wraps. And then now I got my, um, my thread right at the eye of the hook and my most tight wrap here is gonna happen at the end. And so there we go. And then right now, I'm just gonna cut it. So it got that nice fluffy tail there and that's it. Throw a little bit of a half hitch there. So we'll call that a day with that uh, full motion crayfish. And I cannot get my half hitch on there. And again, do you play around with um, uh, glue at all on those exposed thread wraps or best to avoid it such that furry foam is able to soak in water? Yeah, for this, um, you mean on the top shell back here? Like where you made those exposed thread wraps to make the, the ribs, would you glue that? Yeah, I, you know what? I don't. Um, I tie a lot of these flies. And so I like to have um, a large selection of them. This fly, because of that furry foam, you catch an F bass, they're gonna destroy this fly. It does happen. It's not as durable as, as the first fly that I tied today. Yeah. But um, I think it's a very realistic looking version of a crayfish. I'm gonna hold it up to the camera a little better. I'm just pop it to the vise. All righty. Like, look at that sucker right there. Yeah. That, that is going to catch some smallmouth bass. And I'm going to put that right into my box. 
I think that uh, that all that rabbit fur, it really, really slicks down nice in the water and looks just like those claws. I actually think these legs are a little too long, so I'm going to give them a trim. And um, you mentioned it briefly, but yeah, you tie down like right down the bend of the hook with the uh, when tying in the mouth parts and the antennae, so it kind of sticks up, right? Yep, that's exactly it. Yeah. There you go. I mean, it's just kind of like those bonefish flies that you see imitating shrimp, right? Mm -hmm. um, just to show you guys some other color variations, there's one there that's like an olive color with a nice brown um, shell back on it. That's brown furry foam. Um, again, works probably equally as well. Um, but I would say that this fly here is just such a winner of a crayfish fly. I, I bet you I have 25, 30 of these things tied up already for this year. And I'm going to be tying more. Any uh, unique way of fishing these guys compared to those other two? So I would say um, that the, that full motion crayfish, um, I'm going to be typically fishing that because that furry foam is on there. Um, if I'm dredging some deeper holes, you're going to need some split shot, like almost for sure you're going to need some split shot on there. Um, and I'm going to be using the rod tip to move the fly and I won't be using like actual hand strips because I want to just twitch that and give those little pulses. So crayfish swims like like that. That's exactly what I want to do when I'm fishing that. And so this, this full motion crayfish, I would say for me and my fly box is like, uh, one, I will reach for almost right away. And one that I'll fish in just about all the different circumstances. I'm not just going to be looking for those shallow fish. I'm not just going to be, um, fishing it in dirty water, I'll fish this thing in clear water, dirty water, everything. This is an everything pattern. It's awesome. You really and nailed it when you came up with this thing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I, I love it personally. If, if you're fishing, again, uh, let's say lakes and you wanted to beef it up a bit, would you go beyond a four, like tie it a little bigger? Or? Yeah, I'm I just trying to my fly it. boxes. Hang on a second. I, uh, I got a really huge one here. Hang on. Sure. Ugh. I meant to pull it out. Uh, for the uh the show here well i guess that one is probably on a four but like i'll show you the difference in sizes here where did it go so yeah there we go there's the big meaty one there what i actually do that's a bit different on a, a huge one like that not huge one. I, I'm saying, I can't say it's huge because <laughs> the, the flies that like a lot of other guys are throwing are way bigger is instead of palmering the rabbit up the, the shank of the hook, I actually just use the, um, uh, the actual, uh, strips instead of, instead of like wrapping a hackle up the body. And I got a hackle down the, down the, um, as legs as well, but yeah, sense. another awesome, awesome, awesome fly there. Um, as my autofocus kicks in, you can see that that looks just like a dang crayfish man. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good one. That's a good one. I'll pop that in my vice right now. So my thing has something to focus on. Um, but yeah, I did want to show you guys a couple other flies. Um, I mean, these are just ones that I like. Again, when you're fishing river bass, like they, I don't want to say they're not fussy because they are fussy, but they eat a whole host of other things. Um, I also really like woolly buggers that have rubber legs dangling off of them. And so like in the lighting conditions here, not, not the best for seeing a black fly, but um, a, a black woolly bugger with rubber legs hanging off of it, man, you can't go wrong with that. That's another just great fly. Um, and I'd be amiss to talk about bass and not talk about clouds or minnows. I tie tons and tons of clouds or minnows. Uh, orange and brown also looks like a crayfish. Um, that might not look like a crayfish to me and you and our um, putting our uh, uh, kind of human eyes on it, but when that thing is swimming and everything's all tucked in and the bucktail absorbs water and moves around everywhere, that's another really, really, really good fly for bass. So um, yeah, I hope, uh, I don't know, I hope I, I gave you guys enough uh, uh, tips and tricks and hopefully you guys tie some of these. Um, I recommend tying all of them. Uh, you can't go wrong with that first simple fly. Um, that's a real winner for me. I bet you I could you just throw that on and find success and probably all the streams that I've uh, fished river smallmouth in. Um, there's something really cool about fishing uh, uh, something that looks a little bit more um, uh, realistic. And, and I do take a lot of, actually I'm looking at this one. This one's actually had a tippet tied to it. <laughs> so I've actually fished that one. Um, but something a little bit more realistic can be a lot of fun to fish too. So um, yeah, it, I mean, the world is your oyster when it comes to crayfish flies. 
down as realistic as you want, but I highly recommend that you guys try it. Um, was there any other questions about this stuff? No, I think you covered it pretty well there. Uh, do a quick once over here. I, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, pretty sure you answered everything that people threw up there. And yeah, I'll, I'll personally endorse uh, certainly the last one is <laughs> personal favorite, but uh, yeah, any of those for sure. Um, awesome. The absolute killers out there. Um, yeah, and lots of species crossover, like you say, too. So like these things for carp definitely work. Um, we were chatting about it on our last night a little bit. And, um, you know, trout do eat uh, crayfish as a, a decent part of their diet as well. Um, you know, even, you know, steelhead, um, there's certainly... Uh, lots of reports of, of steelhead, especially in the Maitland, I know, predating on, on crayfish. So I don't know if these particular patterns be your best bets for the species. There might be other flies that could work better for them, but um, definitely a food source to, to pay good attention to. 100%. Um, I was just checking my phone there. I had a bunch of notes written down about stuff that I wanted to talk about. Um, yeah, we didn't really get into it too much, but man, if there's crayfish in the water, I think any game fish is eating it. Yeah. Uh, I had a really uh, interesting experience. It was actually, again, on the grand surprise rise. Um, and I was fishing this super small one. This guy here, it's like, uh, I think it's a 10, maybe, maybe an eight. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it, all it is is a woolly bugger, guys, with some, some eyes on it, nothing more. Um, and I was fishing that one. And uh, man, I thought I had this small bass in my life on. It ended up being about a 28 inch pike. <laughs> um, so decent sized pike. I don't know how that tippet held on because uh, that thing was way down that pike's mouth, but um, good sized pike, man, even they're eating crayfish. So um, I think any game fish is really gonna, gonna take them. Um, I have tried them for trout. I've tried these a couple of these patterns for trout. Um, I mean, I don't have any personal experience uh, uh, catching nice fish on them or anything like that. But uh, I mean, I think if there's crayfish in the water, the trout are eating them. There's no way that they're not, right? Yeah. Maybe, maybe a little smaller fly than this one. I don't know. But uh, um, yeah, I hope you guys will give this one, uh, at least try the full motion one. Um, try that turkey tail one. Um, and if you want to get crazy and flashy and uh, definitely try that complex twist one, that's another really good fly. Yeah, sweet. Yeah. Well, thank you again, Nick, for, for doing this for us. Hey, no worries. It was my pleasure. Thanks for spending the evening with me, guys. I mean, it's uh, definitely uh, a real honor to, to be asked to do this stuff. I, I, I don't know. I hope, um, I hope everyone had a good evening and, and maybe it was tying along. But uh, if you want to reach out to me, I'm pretty easy to find. I mean, you can get my details through Chris or, uh, or the shop or just go find me on Instagram or anything else. Um, uh, folks, your, uh, your username on Instagram would be it's at Salmographer. So it's just Salmo. Um, and then Ographer says primarily I'm taking pictures of uh, Salmonids. So uh, that's where that came from. But um, I mean, I bass are easily just as beautiful. So maybe I need a, a new hand. Yeah, <laughs> I need to change my name because I'm just totally connected to this bass thing. <laughs> <laughs> awesome well, thank you so much for having me and uh yeah guys i mean I'm, the reason why i like doing these things is uh i've been fly fishing a long time um well before uh uh the internet and social media and things and uh i just love talking about it and i love people reaching out to uh just be part of this awesome community so don't be shy don't be afraid to hit me up and uh, if you want to talk bass or anything else you guys know where to find me awesome That's and of course as always if anyone wants materials we've got everything and more for these flies uh, down the shop. So feel free to hit us up if you need anything there. And otherwise we will see everyone soon. We've got uh, um, a couple more presentations coming up in the near term. Uh, we have uh, one only Ian Troop doing a couple more things with us, dates to be confirmed before spring. We've got uh, another what the fly um, in the works as well. So keep your eyes out for that and we'll see everyone soon. Awesome, I'm gonna come out to those ones, man. Ian's are awesome. Yeah, absolutely. Every time. Cool. Yeah, guys. Bye guys. Take care. Bye.